In Paris, they know Anglo-French relations have had their ups and downs over the centuries. But at the Jena Bridge, built by Napoleon to mark his defeat of the Prussians, something happened when the tables were turned and Europe's armies took Paris. A British general showed the way to a new relationship. The Duke of Wellington discovered that his Prussian allies were about to come down here and blow the bridge up. They regarded it as a sign of their humiliation. The Duke posted British soldiers at both ends of the bridge to stop them doing it and saved the Jena Bridge for the people of Paris. And since the final fall of Napoleon, it's been the same story time and again of Britain backing the French up, often against the Germans, in one international crisis or war after another. And that's why security and military people, particularly in Paris, express their alarm the prospect of Brexit. But if defence and security cooperation really takes place in NATO or through bilateral ties, why on earth should leaving the EU have any effect on it at all? A Brexit vote uh, would be a lose-lose proposition. There would be less Great Britain in the world and as a result of British departure there would be less Europe in the world. Even if you are no longer what you used to be exactly, you still are on par with us. I mean, the two countries, France and Great Britain, uh, still uh, claiming the title of being the deputy sheriff of the United States. Uh, we can't ask that uh, from the Germans, the Italians, the Spaniards or the Poles. These days, when French soldiers storm the south of England, it's by invitation. The current Griffin strike exercises involve thousands of British and French troops. It's part of an extensive cooperation between the two countries in NATO, the EU, and bilaterally. A British exit, to me, is opening the lid of Pandora's box. I don't think it's possible to argue that the rest of the Union would be unaffected by this. It's, they will be, but how, in what way, is a far more, difficult, um, far more difficult question to answer, and I'm not sure that I have one. But I just sense that um, the upheaval would not be limited to the United Kingdom or indeed arguably to continental Europe. The, the ripples could go wider, it seems to me. If you look, uh, Among senior officers and intelligence bosses on both sides of the channel, I've found that pro-Brexit views are in the minority. But Rear Admiral Roger Lane Knott feels the EU actually harms British security. I'm a NATO man, I'm very supportive of NATO, as you'd expect, having been a NATO commander. But the reality is I didn't see that the EU was actually doing its job properly, pulling its weight. And then I suppose the final straw for me, really, was the fact that, that um, uh, Juncker decided that he wanted a European army and a European navy, when actually what they should be doing is putting all their efforts behind NATO. Of course, there is a more immediate challenge for Europe, the spectre of further attacks by the Islamic State group. Intelligence is critical to preventing that. And there's a feeling here too that key relationships would survive a possible Brexit. The essence of intelligence cooperation is, at the end of the day, what the respective parties are able to bring to the table and the United Kingdom, I think, still will have significant equities uh, to bring to the table. So that, at the end of the day, is probably going to be the key thing in terms of uh, how this collaboration continues.
But when the France-Germany game came under attack in Paris last November, Europe's intelligence weaknesses were shown up. Much has been happening since to close gaps, and opponents of Brexit argue Britain could lose out on that work. Well, what it does lose, um, quite categorically, is the automaticity of access to um, the data sets that uh, other European services uh, have. So travel information, uh, credit card expenditure, mobile phone usage, and if the United Kingdom was no longer part of the EU, um, I assume we would have to renegotiate um, access you know, to those data sets. The recent French and Belgian attacks have also caused the public to make a link between migration and terrorism. The discovery first that one of the suicide bombers here and then that other members of the Paris plot had come into Europe through the Greek islands pretending to be Syrian refugees on fake passports and then worked their way from country to country across Europe caused the whole nature of the migration debate to change. Many in Britain couldn't believe the security shortcomings that had been shown up by the attacks. But in some other EU countries, they decided to take practical steps to change that state of affairs. It was Austria in particular that showed a willingness to push the envelope in order to regain control of its borders. The Austrians took a series of steps. Firstly, they put this fence on their border with Slovenia, not the most physically robust of obstacles, but very politically significant because it cut two Schengen states where there's supposed to be free movement of people from each other. Then they put a ceiling on the number of asylum seekers they would accept in Austria this year. That ran counter to EU and German policy. And then they started organising the Balkan countries down the refugee stream to take their own concerted action to stop the flow of migrants in through the EU. The desire to take control, whatever the European Commission said, was not accompanied in Vienna by any move to leave the EU. Strictly. Austria's Strictly, yes. display of independent-mindedness extended to marshalling its neighbours, some in the EU, some not, to stop hundreds of thousands moving across their country. You know, we still urge for a European solution. And of course, a European solution is always the better solution. But there was, at the beginning of this year, a situation where we uh, thought we cannot wait any longer. Do you have an idea how many asylum seekers are now entering the country since the Greek border was closed in Macedonia? We had 800, 900 asylum seekers on one day. Now we have around 100 on one day. That's the difference. So what's actually happening on Austria's border with Slovenia? At the peak of the migration crisis, 4,000 people a day were passing through this center. It was one of the principal hotspots. Sleeping area. The main sleeping area. Yeah, there, there are four of those. But workers here told us that since early March, when Macedonia closed its border with Greece as part of that plan coordinated by Austria, nobody has arrived here. Now they're starting to dismantle the transit camp. The transformation is quite remarkable. Now you could argue that the migration crisis shows how incapable the EU is and therefore provides another reason why the UK should be leaving. But look at it another way. The actions of a country like Austria in driving a coach and horses through the EU's asylum rules and the Schengen Agreement have displayed that it can act energetically in its national interest and not even think about leaving the EU.
If there are now grounds for hope that Europe can get on top of the migrant crisis, there are still bigger security questions looming and reminders about how past crises were solved. In a corner of Vienna, there's a little relic of the Soviet Union that most people have long forgotten. This war memorial reminds us that for 10 years after the war, Austria, like Germany, was a divided country. But the Soviet army left here in return for a treaty signed by the great powers guaranteeing that Austria would not join NATO and would remain a neutral state. The Russian foreign minister has flown in to meet his western opposite numbers at the Belvedere Palace and sign a treaty making Austria free. By December 31st, all four countries' occupation forces will be out of Austria. There can be no doubt in Austrian minds that this is a step towards a real world peace. Today, as in the 1950s, the Kremlin is very keen to stop certain countries joining NATO or even the Western family of nations more generally. And of course, it is the smaller states or the weaker ones that find that type of pressure hardest to resist. Would Europe be more tempted uh, to adopt an appeasement policy towards Moscow without Great Britain? That might very well be the case. At least that's probably the thinking of uh, Vladimir Putin in Moscow uh, when you see that he wants very much, in a way, uh, Great Britain to leave uh, the European Union. But for those who favour Brexit, that's not a decisive argument. I'm not sure Putin would be too worried about it. Uh, he would smile and I think he would look at what's going on, but he may be worried that actually this could force the UK to be even closer to the US than we are now. But uh, um, the UK not being part of the European Union doesn't make much difference to whatever his plans may be. While Britain works out its exit terms, if that's what happens, the world won't stand still. The terror threat will remain high in Europe and Russia assertive. Britain's allies would rather not be dealing with Brexit as well. So why has President Obama gone out of his way to make it clear that he does not wish Britain to leave the European Union? Well, it's because Washington is of the belief, and I believe they're right, that they can influence and guide European security better with their um, old ally in the Union rather than out of it. If NATO remains the cornerstone of Western security, why are Britain's closest friends, the US and France, so worried about the possibility of Brexit? Well, what insiders will tell you is they're concerned that if the British voice was no longer at the table at those European summits and other meetings, the others would be more likely to shun difficult decisions to appease, in other words. As one Frenchman put it to me, without Britain, we're surrounded by herbivores. Being useful to America, or for that matter France or Germany, might seem a bit craven to many Britons, but that, after all, is the basis of alliances, mutual interest and dependence. At the University of Paris Dauphine, there's a reminder that those factors sometimes trump national pride. This utterly unremarkable building was until 1966 the headquarters of NATO. But the whole lot had to go when General de Gaulle threw them out. Now you might argue that the whole saga of General de Gaulle and NATO shows that you can have huge ructions within an international organisation, throw it out even, and in the end, people just get used to it and move on. But there is a sting in the tail, because having done what they did in the 60s, the French spent decades regretting it, and in fact, the best part of 20 years wheedling their way 
back into the military structure of the Western Alliance. The unknowable, from Paris to Washington, is whether those ties of mutual interest would be sufficiently strong for those allies to make light of the headaches that might well follow Brexit. <laughs>